Right, so I'm with a good friend of mine, Nathan Thomas, who works for the Manchester United Foundation. Nathan, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Dale. Good to see you in Manchester. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And if you're wondering about the background noise, we're sat in the Bishop's Blaze um, after having a, a drink. No alcohol. Oh, very boring today, isn't it, really? Yeah, get that one in. Lots of games, that's the problem. Too many games, too many, too much booze. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking the advantage of a bit of time off. Of and time as off. well... Uh, Eric Ten Hag makes it quite expensive to be a Manchester United fan, maybe. You forget, don't you? Like the amount of, you know, like last last season, what we were out of the cup very early doors. League Cup was September, I think, against West Ham. Obviously, Europe was was Atletico in the last sixteen or quarters. I can't remember what season. It was last season. Spanish team, anyway. Yeah. So it was very early, and then yeah. So yeah, this season just seems to be constant, and then. I've, I, like me and my brother who I go to games with, we've, uh, we've done quite well with the ways, although we're now getting a lot of stick from friends because we try and justify ourselves that we've, the games that we've got in the ballot have been some of the tougher games, but obviously some of the tougher games have been absolutely smashed. So right, trying to think, I've, got, I've got Arsenal, obviously, lost Anfield, let's just not talk about that, Etihad, we've got that as well, Newcastle, I went to that, we have, rest assured, seen us win on the road this year, but yeah, there's been a few absolute stinkers, absolute stinkers, but as I said to you before, like, in spite of that, it's, it's been a great season in Ten Hag with, with other issues that he's had to deal with as well, it's been, certainly here at Old Trafford, it's been fantastic, it's been some great moments. You had a busy week two weeks ago, Seville and Wembley? Yep. Highs and lows of football? Absolutely, yeah. I think you know, I always say like it, it does help if you get um again that was another one I forgot about Seville, like you can add that to the list that I yes. mentioned before. Yes. But um, yeah, it's not so bad when you're in a beautiful Spanish city when you get when you get a paste in, but it was yeah, it just shows you doesn't it you can go from one day and you you're really down after that and then a couple of days later and you're bouncing or you're going into a, an FA Cup final, which obviously is uh, exciting incredibly daunting prospects uh, given the given the opponents in that one but you know you look at the start of the season and you think back to where we were you think that's where we were at the start of the season but certainly after those first two games and you're looking and you're thinking wow what what would, what would class as a success in this season and I don't even know what I was thinking at the time but if you'd have offered us top four which we're looking good for a trophy the potential of another you know we were in for another trophy up until last week Yeah. given this is year one of what Tenard wants to do you know, hats off to the guy who's been, you know, overall been really Hats off, ball his best. Exactly, don't want to see it, say no hats, get that flat cap off at it. <laughs> Let's see that shiny head of yours. So, FA Cup finally going? Hopefully, so uh, we've done the rest, so hopefully, you know, we get we, we get lucky in the ballot. I know there's a reduced allocation, so I think we should be fine, but obviously until you get that ticket, um, we've applied for like a staff trip that they do. Um, as a kind of a backup, so uh, obviously this, this this would have to be the first time that I decided to book a train down right. to the uh, to okay. the club. I do the bus normally, so I thought, you know what? Given it's all the clubs coming from Manchester, both clubs coming from Manchester, for let's let's get a train, let's stay over. As you would like, day after, yeah, let's day after. It's like trains are striking. It's like brilliant. So um, so yeah, so I don't quite know what travel arrangements will be at the moment. But, Probably a bus. Well, yeah, I'm, well, I'm toying with driving down and thinking whether. If we're going to stay over, I might drive down. We'll see. But yeah, it's going to be one where I remember like the 2011 semi final. It's just like an awful day generally. And obviously, it was particularly bad for us winning. But it's got a blue, a blue in the office, a blue in the office at United, believe it or not. Who, uh, and he was like, it was like exactly we won, but it was awful when we won. It was just a horrible day in general. So whether, whether that will have changed slightly because at the time, obviously, City. You know, they haven't won anything at that point or won anything in the modern era and, you know, a bit of a chip on the shoulder. Things have changed yeah. massively since then. But I still I still think it will be um, I still think it will be pretty uh, it'll be pretty tense around Wembley on that day, but hopefully it's uh, the arches red again come the end of it. I was just thinking about it though. Get the train down from Manchester. It would be tense. Yeah. Well you know, someone mentioned to me the other day about the idea of whether the whether the police have pushed for this strike on that day yeah. to avoid, because I guess if you're, if you're all coming down on a bus, they can at least separate service stations and stuff, they can at least control it. Whereas if you're all on the same train, how much can they control that? Not one for conspiracy, conspiracy theory, so I'm not sure to buy it, but I, I see the logic behind Tim it. Tim Floyd and all they that. Must, they must have thought, exactly, they must have thought when that happened, the police is like worse, but I bet they were prey of XGMP and 
London police were just praying for Brighton in that um, in that penalty shoot out and just make it a nice easy day for them. But yeah, but the, I always say like it's, it, I don't think there's many Reds that are relishing this prospect of playing City in a final, and I count myself in that. But and I don't, I don't mean that just from I think we can beat them. I definitely think we can beat them. But obviously. You know, I gave right, I gave it? that talk before the semi final. You know, I didn't fancy us against Brighton, and I was giving myself some you know some po- some minor positives, thinking well, we won't beat City, will we? <laughs> but then in the lead up, I was hearing all this talk about City winning the treble. Yeah, yeah. And I would like no one more than us to yeah. be the ones to try and stop them. Yeah. Because I'd hate to be sat there on the FA Cup final day and not being United or being Brighton yeah. and thinking, fuck, these guys are on for a treble. Yeah, 100%. But with us doing it or trying to do it, if they get to that treble point, um, I'm a little bit more relaxed than it would be with Brighton. I, no, you're totally right. I think I don't quite get that argument that some people have, like, oh, oh well, Brighton might have had a better chance of beating him and, you know, us losing some in the final. One thing, that's, that. one thing that's, like, annoyed me so much over the past few years, it seems to be every year in the past five seasons, there's been one of Liverpool or City who were on for the quadruple or the treble. Thankfully, it never happened. But what used to annoy me at the time is that we were nowhere, we were in no position to, to stop them doing it, and that pissed me off. You know, yeah. because I always used to and Liverpool and yeah. Liverpool. Yeah, I thought against, I thought against those teams, we could still beat them. You know, we've been able to beat them over the past few seasons, despite having much inferior teams. And it annoyed me that we're just hoping we're relying on Real Madrid or Chelsea or whoever it is to stop that happening. And obviously, you don't want, you don't want it to happen, whatever. But it annoyed me that we weren't there. And I think it's also what you would not hope, but United should now be starting to be in more finals with Manchester City. The reason that United have not been in more finals with Manchester City over the past 10 years is an indictment on United's downturn in fortunes. Especially in the last 10, 15 exactly, years. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it would have happened more often, but because of United and where we've been, it's not happened. So not, as much as it's not, a, it's not a prospect that we'll probably enjoy at the time, it'd be obviously mint if we win, but... That it needs to be happening because we need that, that shows that we're on the right path in terms of competing for trophies again. Well, what we if want. we beat them in the FA Cup final, I'll be happy if it never happens again. Uh, yeah, I can totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> if we beat them in the Cup final, I'll just be so over, like, just so happy about it. Uh, yeah, I, I won't be thinking beyond that at that point. Yeah. I mean, it would just be a fantastic end to a very positive season, wouldn't it? Just a question because I've seen it pop up on social media a lot this morning. General kind of football chat. You're looking at the season Arsenal have had so far and this kind of um, implosion that we're seeing right now. We've had a better season than them, right? I so I'm going to stick up for Arsenal here. Okay. But but I'm also going to agree with you. I think so, like if if the if the if City do what they, we think they're going to do and win the league, yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Unless you win the league, I'm not asked where you are as long as you're in the top four. Yeah. And then beyond that, you want a trophy. And that's, you know, I'm looking at it. If, we, if United finished second and won nothing, I'd rather have finished third or fourth and won something. Absolutely. It, you know, all counts are the same. Now, with Arsenal, me sticking up for Arsenal, I, I just feel like they're obviously, they're going to be gutted. Of course, yeah, to go so long in it and probably now not win it. But I also feel that you'd have never put them anywhere near it at the start of the season. You might not have even put them in the top four. They're an incredibly young team. It was kind of, it felt like it's been on the cards for a while. And I don't think said, okay, you could you could make an argument for them, quote unquote, bottling it. But I just feel the games that they, they drew, the big one for me was Southampton. I thought like Anfield, yeah, again, not great, but it can happen there, as we well know. Even West Ham to a point, you know, it's an away game in the Premier League. It just happens with the Spurs. Southampton was a one where it's like, yeah, that, you know, they, they've, they've lost it there and they should be doing better. But they're a really young team and they've, and they've gone so to so with Man City until April. No, you're right. And I think something we spoke about before we started recording about this season with United and Ted Hag and the job he's done. We're all on a journey. And Arsenal fans with you are very similar with Arteta. You're mentioning games that they won this season that they shouldn't have. Last season they weren't winning. Yeah, yeah. And and being in the challenge with City up until this point, which they could not have even imagined at the start of the campaign. So, as fans, I'm sure they're very happy. But that cup final at Wembley was fantastic. The Carabao Cup. Yeah. We'd have another one with with the FA Cup, whether we win it or not. It could be another amazing day out. 
and what Ten Hag has done this season, I, I just think it's remarkable in his first year, Absolutely. considering what we had last year. Oh yeah. Oh, we've no. I I totally I, I agree with Ferdinand in the way that it's you know I won't. You know, if Arsenal finish second, which is probably what's going to happen, I won't swap our season for theirs. I don't care. It could finish third. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If they sort of they go into a bit of a downward spiral now after seemingly let it slip. Yeah, one hundred percent. But yeah, I, I, you know, if Arsenal were on to win the FA Cup, for example, then if they won that and finish second and have gone toe to toe, then you say, yeah, they've had a better season than United. They've gone, but you know, it's, it's ultimately for, for clubs of that size, it's all about the silverware, you know, and those moments in, in the cup final. Like we were talking about before, you know, United fans has been so spoiled under Alex Ferguson, and, and the time since has almost kind of made you realise just how unbelievably good we had it. And speaking for myself, it like. I just thought when we that like, Stockholm was brilliant, like the Wembley Cup finalists in 2016. But when these happen, I'm just going to save them, and I don't care if I get stick for overly celebrating a League Cup final. I do not give a shit. You know what I mean? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to enjoy it because it might be the last one. You never know. So it is all about that. So yeah, I've been like unless United are winning the league. As long as we're in the top four, I don't really care whether a second, third, or fourth. And I guess it goes back to uh, so Oli and him not winning the Europa League and how that was kind of the almost the final name in the yeah, coffin for him. Yeah. Um, and it's important, you know. So, so Ten Hag came in. I think people would have given this first year without a trophy had we had we not won one and got top four. People yeah. would have been happy, would have been happy with that. But I think to have that kind of off his back now. Going into a second season, we can really build it. Yeah, definitely. It certainly helps, doesn't it? Because you're right. I think we started this podcast by talking about what were what were our expectations at the start of this year, and I think before the first two games, you're thinking maybe slightly optimistically at top four with a trophy. After the first two games, you're still thinking that is the absolute best we can do, but it's probably not going to happen. So for us to then do that, and like you say, he, he could have. He probably would have got a year pass in terms of winning nothing, certainly if he gets us in the top four, but then from next season onwards, then, then the pressure starts to build a little bit and the longer it goes on. So just to get that the monkey off the back so early and give it give the whole club a boost, and it really did give a boost, like you know, it was like staff trip. I obviously went down with Mage, but there was a whole staff trip went down and, and people are united fans to uh, to vary in all lesser extents, you know, and but it's just it's, a, it's just a top top feeling, and it brings the club, and it's like this is what this should be the start of it now, you know. We've not we're nowhere near the top of the mountain, nowhere near, but it's a start. It's a good feeling, and we push on from here, and that's kind of the feeling that we've got, and that's what it just kind of validates things, doesn't it? Like at the start of the season, don't get me wrong, if Ten Hag gets us top four, and that's it, it's a decent enough start, yeah, yeah. given what he took over in the summer, but to get a trophy and then to hopefully get us another one. You know, fantastic. You know, we're up in the clouds in three years' time. Well, I know. Look, look I mean, it's, been, it's been a long enough ten years, <laughs> and it's still be incredibly cautious. I, I, I think listeners may well have got the gist that I am very much glass half full, but I'm still, you know, kind of united. You know, I, I mean, at the start of this year, there was lots of united are back talk, which is which has happened quite a few times, and we've very much not been back. We're not back until we're winning Premier Leagues and Champions Leagues. You know, that's yeah. that's where United need to be. But yeah, there's, there's definitely room for some real optimism, and hopefully that continues over the next few weeks and months. Absolutely. So, and your work at the yeah. foundation. Tell us what you do. So, I work uh, in the media and communications team at the foundation. I've been there now for it's coming up to three years. So, for those that, you, that don't know, so Manchester United Foundation, you may have heard of it, you may have seen it in programs on the website if you look on the club website or wherever it might be. But we're a, we're a youth charity that works in and around primarily Greater Manchester. We, we were set up in 2007, and the idea behind it, and it's a romantic ideal, but I think it really works. Is it's a, it's a tribute, it's a mark the 50 years since the the Bucky Babes, the title winning team, to set up a charity that works primarily with young people. Uh, and young people in areas of Greater Manchester with higher levels of deprivation to ensure that those those kids in those areas are given an opportunity to to succeed and that's not just in sport that is in just in whether it's academic whether it is sport whatever it is that may be but it's kids that might normally slip through the net for want of a better expression and the way we work we do it in a number of ways we have 30 plus, I think it's 33 now partner high schools around Greater Manchester. We also work, we also now work in partnership with Worcester University in Northern Ireland. We have a partner school in Carlisle and one in London. And in each of those schools, we have a, a hub officer, so they work for us, but to all intents and purposes, they're a member of staff. 
that are walking around in a Man United tracksuit. And the idea is, it's to work with kids on a one-to-one -one basis and in group sessions to sort of support them along the way with kind of leadership and mentoring, additional work, just to help those that might normally kind of not that get that additional help. Get that support. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then beyond that, we're obviously able to offer them some fantastic enrichment opportunities, whether it's volunteering work at the club. Even the work throughout COVID, I spoke to John Shields yeah. on, the, on his podcast and some of the stuff that we did or spoke about with the money raised over COVID was fantastic. It's amazing. I think what people probably don't realise, and, and I include myself in that, you know, that how... In the first, it, this would have been in 2020, yeah, 2020, Christmas 2020 when I first started. And as part of that activation that you talk about, where we provided like 80,000 meals to schools around yes, Greater Manchester, yeah. we went out over Christmas to dish these out in certain areas. So I went to one of our schools in Withenshaw, and there were so many people that were queuing for these food parcels. Yeah. And, it, and it, you know, and in Withenshaw, you are, you're a stone's throw from a place like Wilmslow and Style in Cheshire, you know, very affluent, very wealthy areas. And yet, You've still got people here who are needing additional just to get basic food in the cupboard, you know, and, and it and it highlights that there is a real there's a real disparity between in, in terms of wealth, in terms of opportunity for certain people depending on where you where you live and where you're brought up and that's not right and that is what we we look to kind of channel the ethos of Manchester United, which is investing in young people, investing in the area to just to just support people, basically. Yeah, I think knowing you down the years, someone that I, I, I've described as being very passionate about United, and now I can kind of get a greater insight into to kind of why it's not just based on the football, but your work and that doing that kind of work and seeing the people you were helping, it must fill you with pride. Oh, 100 percent. Like yesterday, we had uh, we won a a BTEC sport course in conjunction with Eccles College. Uh, so this is for kids who are maybe looking to go into coaching or sport in a, in a different way, not necessarily at, at a, an elite level. And uh, obviously next week, the club will unveil in the statue of Jimmy Murphy in the back of the yeah. end. So we had Jimmy Murphy Jr., his son, come in uh, to deliver a workshop to these kids to tell them about his dad and the importance of his dad. And a lot of these kids had maybe heard Jimmy Murphy's name, maybe they'd never heard of him at all. But what I said to the kids before Jimmy spoke to them, Jimmy Jr. spoke to them, was that they are there as a, as a kind of an indirect legacy of what Jimmy Murphy and what Man United stands for, which is giving young people an opportunity, whether that's, you know, in Gary Neville's, Brian Giggs, Paul Scholes of this world, or just a normal kid in Manchester who wants to make his way and wants to achieve something. And those kids kind of went away, and I think they were felt quite inspired by the kind of the association of it so there's there's a real I feel there's a really sort of snug link between you know what United has done for many years obviously we have this very proud academy record but what the foundation does is it takes that it takes that attitude and that passion out into the community and we have people who will start at maybe a, a primary school that has a foundation officer there and in some instances they then end up working for us 10 15 years later so yeah as a as a local red as someone who's kind of passionate about the history of man united to tie that all together yeah it's i really enjoy doing it and i think blowing our own trumpet for a second i think we do some really good work we really do nathan pleasure to have you on the podcast how can people follow you on social media? So if you want to follow me, I'm Nathan L. Thomas. I think that's my, yeah, that is my handle. The foundation on Twitter is at MU underscore foundation. People, no matter where you are in the world, if you wanted to check us out, you can look at mufoundation.org. You can fundraise for us if you so wish. That would be amazing. Of course, you know, ultimately, we are a charity, so we rely on the donations of, of generous people, generous friends, generous people from around the world. So you can contact me, you can contact the foundation on how you can help out in, uh, in many different ways. But yeah, if you want to, do not hesitate to get in touch. Thanks again, Nick. Pleasure, mate.